I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Richard Epstein, the Hoover Institution. He teaches law at NYU and the University of Chicago. You will enjoy this. Richard's about to report on a trailer park, the likes of which no one has ever imagined in the history of the solar system. That's about four billion years. This trailer park, and there's a series of them, mobile homes, uh, have routinely Teslas pulled up next door being charged. And the people, the young people who live in these mobile homes, and they're not sparklingly fresh mobile homes, want very much to live in Mountain View, California, or nearby. Why? Because that's the epicenter of the Google universe. But housing, housing, housing. As there was a housing crunch in Washington and New York during the Second World War, there is a housing failure, a a uh, comet hit Mountain View and a comet hit Palo Alto and a, con- a po- comet hit the whole area. That comet is filled with money, but money can't buy you a place to lay your head. Richard, a very good evening to you. Population 80,000, you report, of Mountain View, California. And what is to be done about the rentals and about the purchases? They seem to be reinventing uh, the the a policy that New York is now burdened with these many years, rent control. Are, is that what they're doing to themselves? Good evening to you, Richard. Well, I would say that's not the singular. It's one of the many things that the people in Mountain View are doing to themselves. And, of course, it's, it's a very highly divisive situation. Uh, the people who benefit most from the rent control are the tenants who are sitting in the various premises because when you cap the rents, you don't let the landlord pick the tenant. He has to renew the current tenant sitting there unless there's some serious defalcation. Uh, the way in which the ordinance was drafted is they looked at the California cases on this and they made sure that they did not cross over the line into making this into a confiscatory arrangement. The model that they're using is you treat these individual homes as though they're public utilities and you give the uh, owner of the premises a reasonable rate of return determined by the state on the cost of putting the unit together and any improvements they make. But these units have gone up far beyond their original cost. And the theory is if the costs go up 10 percent and the value goes up 50 percent, then the other 40 percent will go to the tenant. And so once you have this renewal system in there, it means that all the nurses and all the teachers and all the truck drivers who want to move into Mountain View are going to be shut out. So what happens is it doesn't improve the stock of housing. It just protects those people who are already there. This is Measure 5V for the Roman 5 uh, that was approved on the November 8th ballot in Mountain View. Richard, I want to check here. Your your case here, is this different from New York? That sounds very much what happened to the west side of New York the last 50 years, the rent it's control. Very much, uh, the, the ordinances all take the same form. They realize that you can't tell the landlord you have to provide all these services at zero cost. So what they try to do is to make sure that the landlord gets just enough money to keep the place in operating shape and get some kind of return on the investment, and then all the appreciation goes. The New York system is somewhat different. Uh, rent stabilization, which is what they are putting into uh, California, covers about 2 million units, but there are probably 1 million of them that rent for prices that are below the stabilization. If you go out to Astoria, Queens, and other places. But when you get to the epicenter on the Upper West Side, uh, some fancy parts on the around NYU and Greenwich Village, you get to Prospect Heights or whatever it's called in Brooklyn. At that point, the actual rents that you charge are a tiny fraction of what the fair market value of the property will be. Figuring out what that value is, John, is kind of tricky. If you just simply removed one unit from rent control, if the rent control maximum is $2,500, uh, that one unit, if it was left to float in the current market, would rent for eleven dollars or $12,000, $10,000 or whatever. So you're talking about a premium of about a you know, $8,000 a month, which is close to $100,000 a year. And if you capitalize that, you know, you're talking about an investment, half a million or a million dollars. It's a lot of money that goes to these sitting tenants under the controls. Uh, but if, in fact, you deregulated the entire amount, the rent increase would be much less dramatic because one of the things that removing rent control does is it increases the carrying capacity of existing units. Instead of having a widow stay in a three-bedroom apartment, she will now move out and a family of four will move in, and you've managed to increase the carrying capacity of the unit by 400%. What would happen everywhere, but it will happen a lot of places. So in Mountain View, is trying to imitate this, but there's no queens in Mountain View. It's sufficiently close. Everything is neat and tidy. All the units will be covered by this. 
Uh, the Google people will now realize that if they want to bring new people in from outside the state, they can't house them uh, realistically in Mountain View. I think in the end what's going to happen is you can't bring your workers into your community. You will take some portions of your business and move them elsewhere, out of Mountain View, out of the Bay Area, out of the peninsula, maybe even out of California. I want to ask how we got into this mess. We didn't have a Second World War breakout. But first, Richard, do I say correctly that what I believe the way I read your piece in Defining Ideas is that this system of rent control in Mountain View is in fact taking money from everybody in order to maintain a, a chosen group as protected. Isn't that what they're doing? Well, all of these programs have to be supported by a huge apparatus. And there's no special assessment placed upon tenants and rent control units to finance this. So it has to come out of general revenues. And anybody who's ever been associated with a rent control system will know that if you're trying to do public utility regulations, you're not doing it on a huge operation where you could get once and for all and deal with a thousand or a million customers. You have to do it apartment by apartment or at least building by building. And the paint job costs this, not that. And somebody says, oh no, it's much too high. You gave it to your brother-in-law. So you're going to go through these intensive hearings, lots of acrimony taking place, and it will be very, very expensive to operate. But make no mistake about it, as you always do in these systems, you have to put a governance structure in, and this, uh, you know, this, this, this motion number five essentially has exactly those kinds of features. So yes, there will be a drag on the public, and it will be shared by people who live in their own homes, by businesses, and probably some of the tax is going to go into Google itself. How did... How did California get into this mess? Did they not see it coming? Is this, a, is, this like a, a, is this like they struck oil and everybody showed up so they, they have a housing crisis? Well, it's the same way that everybody goes in there. People who essentially are market-oriented believe that people respond to incentives. And so that when you start to change the rate of return on an investment, people change the way in which they build houses, the way in which they maintain them, and all the rest of that stuff. Uh, but most of the progressives who are in favor of rent control think that the only thing you do with rent control is to change the price and everything else remains exactly as it is. And that sort of dominated most of the stuff at the time of the 1930s and early 40s when rent control got its permanent foothold in New York. It's the period of the National Labor Relations Act. It's the period of the Agricultural Adjustment Act. And if, in fact, you believe that market movements and market prices are a sign of market failure, then you always have reason to start to move in there. Then what happens is the courts have to figure out what's going on, and their rationales have changed over the time. The first of these rent control systems was in 1921 in a case called Block Against Hearst. Um, it was actually a bitterly divided 5-4 court, but Justice Holmes, writing for the majority, said, two years, war emergency, we're fine with this system. Besides, the statute's already been repealed. But by the time you get to these permanent rent control situations, the definition of an emergency under the New York Code, for example, is you have under 5% vacancies. Well, you're always going to have low vacancy rates if you have very low rents. So this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And every three years you say, do we have an emergency? Every three years you find it, and then you renew the statute. So since the stabilization statute went into place in around 1969, modified, I think, in 1974, there's always been an emergency. So so they always keep these price controls on. Uh, but you have to deal with the progressive mindset, and they regard this as something that actually works, whereas classical liberals and market-oriented people like myself say, in the short term, you can make it look pretty good. If rents go down, you'll get a reprieve. But in the long run, with a sort of inflation, given the administrative rigidity and the massive inefficiencies that you have, two things will take place. Properties will be misallocated so that they'll be undervalued and underused, and there'll be political warfare of the worst sort as people subject to rent control try to get out from it, and people who benefit it from it will use all their political leverage to keep it in place. And remember, there are always more tenants than there are landlords in any given community. I want to talk about remedies, but before we get there, I went too fast. They approved this on November 8th. I think that you're making a case here that that is a progressive trick to take it to the people rather than impose a penalty on the people who are getting an advantage. Claiming that it's the people's will, you say the only people who voted for it had an incentive, had money in it. Well, this is always the case in local 
politics. There's no, there's no trick involved in something underhanded. Uh, California has lots of referendum and initiatives that you could put on the ballot. This is one of them. And what you do is you have a built-in constituency for it because all sitting tenants want it. And the people who would be opposed are those who would be prepared to pay higher rents given the housing constraints, but they don't live in Mountain View or nearby, so they don't get the vote in the elections. It's the territorial bias which makes land use politics so toxic and much harder to remove. When you put price controls on a system, um, it turns out that people realize there are very long lines at the gas pumps, and after a while, nobody's a winner from this situation, and so these things start to lift. But rent control statutes have built-in winners, and to the extent that they have built-in winners, they have built-in durability. I'm speaking to Professor Richard Epstein of the Hoover Institution, writing at Defining Ideas. We're looking at Mountain View, California, which you know is Google. But I could mention Palo Alto, which you know is Stanford and Facebook. Yes, all of these uh, gold strikes, uh, oil strikes in California also connect to the experience I've had in Manhattan and people who are living in Brooklyn are having right now, which is that rent control is the opposite of market thinking, certainly small government, certainly classical liberalism. When we come back, we'll review some of the, uh, in Richard's piece, he introduces me to some of the Supreme Court decisions that support this kind of let everybody else eat cake. Richard Epstein, I'm John Batchelor. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Professor Richard Epstein writing Defining Ideas about the housing crisis in California. But he takes me to a decision I did not know existed. San Remo versus San Francisco, 2002. This looks to be a predicate for what's going on in Mountain View. Richard, does California, do the California jurists hate developers and owners and landlords? Is that what it is? No, I think that's a bit too simple. I think what the basic attitude in California is uh, that we have two classes of freedoms, those that matter and those that don't. And so you're talking about political participation, maybe religious freedom. Those are fine. But, quote, mere property rights are subject to very low levels of constitutional protection. This is something which is a direct outgrowth of the New Deal. The two-tier system was introduced very explicitly in a famous footnote four in the Caroline Products case decided around 1944 by Justice Harlan Spistone, the chief justice at the time. And it sort of carried over into California. Uh, so the way the justices would put it, they're not in favor of rent control. They're not opposed to rent control. But they think that the political process as it unfolds should be what is decisive. And so long as there's any plausible justification for doing this, uh, we are going to be satisfied. And the plausible justification is keeping the rents down for the incumbents. By definition, every rent control statute does that. So what they do is they write long, somewhat sinuous and obscure opinions in these cases. But the bottom line always is uh, people who object to what's going on have to get their relief in the political process. These landlords are well organized. If they have a real case, they can make it. Let them fight. We're not going to help them. And this is the attitude in the United States Supreme Court. It's certainly the attitude in the New York State Court of Appeals, which is our highest court here in New York. And it's the attitude that you see in California. And the San Remo case is exactly like that. And the particulars of the case in San Francisco, I think, are rather instructive as to why it is that the system becomes so perverse. The Mountain View uh, governance, the people who live there, do they have a remedy at this point, or is it hopeless? Should they live in uh, Oregon? Well, I mean, that is a remedy. It's called the exit right. Um, let me put it to you this way. I think under current law, the way the statute was drafted, the way the ordinance was drafted, it was designed to meet all the specifications that California has. That is, what California says is you could get rid of a competitive market if you treat this like a public utility, and that's the actual way that it did. Somebody will come forward with the argument that this system always degenerates in practice, to which the worthies in California will say from the bench, this is not for a facial challenge. This is an ad hoc basis that you could bring in a particular case on what we call an as-applied challenge. So if you challenge this in court, given the way in which the current law works, 
um, it's going to be unanimous that it's upheld. If you then look at the political constitution, uh, the composition of the California Supreme Court, this has been a democratic state for a very long time. It's democratic governors going to democratic legislatures to appoint democratic members of the high court. And so uh, the San Remo case was unanimous, and the more recent case having to do with the San Jose Builders was unanimous as well. And let me just explain the first of these cases so you can see what the problem is, and then later you might want to talk about the second. Uh, San Francisco is an area undergoing transformation, and there are many people who have these single-room occupancy places. They're not quite flop houses, but they're not very fancy. And they want to take everybody out of these things after their leases expire. They have no property protection. And in their place, they want to put in some kind of hotel accommodations, which have much higher value, will improve the tax base. And you're allowed to do that in San Francisco, so long as you basically resettle all the people whom you remove or give the city a very large payment in lieu of particular situations. So there's a huge tax which blocks you from moving real estate to its lower to higher use. So what's the correct remedy is you get rid of all this stuff. If you're thinking about giving aids to displaced tenants, you should do it off of the city budget. And if you really realize that that's going to be high, what you'll do is you'll relax some of the zoning restrictions elsewhere in the city, and then it turns out that the price of these units will fall, and you'll have a bigger tax base and a more vibrant economy. Uh, but when you start to protect the status quo ante, you prevent development in the downtown area, you erode the tax base, and you create a built-in political constituency for no change. And this was unanimously upheld in 2002 in the San Remo case. You also recommend that there is a remedy in the federal Supreme Court for California. This is a macro rescue, Richard. I think what I, what I understand is that we can hope that the federal Supreme Court will uh, impose a better understanding of takings on the governments of California. Is that how to think of this? This would take well, like 30 is, or 40 years. I mean, when you talk about this as a remedy, um, this is a Hail Mary. This is a long shot. Right, right. This is very, very difficult. The federal courts have been more conservative on this than the California courts, but not by much. And so, for example, there's one case in California, a case called Agins, in which what the Worthies did is they imposed large lot zoning on a very fancy town, uh, five acres you had to have, and the local state court said, you know, this is unconstitutional. So what's the remedy? You don't get damages for the loss in value in the interim period. You get the privilege of fighting another one of these zoning ordinances that the state will put forward again. And so you can keep playing the game if you never get money. And the Supreme Court, in the case called First English, said no. If it's a temporary taking like that in which you lose all use and value of the land for a period of time, you're entitled to get some compensation. So that's a switch. Uh, It hasn't worked out that well. Because one of the things that has happened is that the takings law has gotten, in the federal side, has gotten essentially more pro-government than it was before. The favorite case is called Williamson County against Hamilton Bank. Why is there a bank involved in this case? Because the original developer went bankrupt during all these legal proceedings, and then what happened is the bank had to come in. And so, therefore, unless you can change the composition, get three or four conservatives on the court who care about property rights, this is not going to happen. It's very difficult to do this because many of the conservative judges believe in judicial restraints just as much as they believe in property rights. And if you believe in judicial restraints, you don't want to go around telling state governments what they have to do because this is an enormous shift. And if they have that degree of reluctance, nothing will happen. Uh, The situation in Mountain View and in Palo Alto will slowly implode. One of the things I always like to remind people is you cannot regulate in Mountain View the businesses that refuse to locate there. And so there'll be a kind of a slow stagnation and decline, a loss of relative influence, and continued political infighting. And I think that is by far the most likely outcome in this situation. There's one other possibility, that the election of Donald J. Trump, and you indicated in your defining idea, is an indication that the the voting public has lost patience with some aspect of this, Richard. Uh, it's not. A, I'm just asking: is there is there reason to believe that Americans, American citizens, understand that the California system is not working? 
Well, I think what I regard what's happening in Mountain View and in Santa Monica, it's like inoculation. Anybody from another town who sees what goes on in a rent control community decides it's not really worth it for us, given the expense, the hostility, the inefficiencies, and so forth. And so I think in that sense, uh, it's not likely to spread the more publicity that it gets. Uh, but the other thing is when people are trying to say, let's get rid of all of this stuff, they're much more willing to get rid of it on pipelines, where right, the environmental right, right. claims are usually wild overstated because it creates jobs for the locals. Uh, but what rent control does is it protects some locals and keeps some other people disadvantaged. So now what's taking place in San Francisco, where rents are higher than they are in New York in many parts of the town, you don't have a situation where people say, not in my backyard. There's now a YIMBY. Yes, in, yes, yes in, in my, my backyard. backyard. We've got 30 seconds, Richard. Go and ahead. So what's going on here is I do think that there will be a shift in, in the, at the local level, but I think it's likely to be political, and I think that the most likely situation is that you will see a uh, reluctance to put rent control on in other communities which have yet to face this problem. Uh, Mountain View is a hard struggle. I think it's going to turn out to fail. They may yet repeal it in some way, uh, but you can basically be pretty sure that this issue is going to be with us five and ten years from today. Richard Epstein of the Hoover Institution. I'm John Batchelor.